Uh, it's pretty common for independent filmmakers to give their cast and crew a share of the profits from the film. When people talk about back-end points, they're talking about giving the cast and crew a percentage of the profits that the film is going to make in the future. Uh, why do indie production companies offer profit sharing to their cast and crew? Uh, there are different reasons, but it's often because the filmmakers don't have a big enough budget to pay the cast and crew what they would expect in a higher end production, but they still want to attract high quality talent. And so they supplement whatever upfront fee they're paying the cast and crew with the prospect of making more money after the film gets released. So naturally, this is something that a lot of independent filmmakers want to do for budget reasons. But unfortunately, it can be kind of a complicated process. Uh, it's not just as simple as putting a clause in an actor's contract saying you'll get 5% of whatever profits the film makes. Uh, there are a number of other issues that you're going to have to think about from a legal perspective when you're uh, offering this kind of compensation. Uh, in this video, I'll talk about what I think are the key issues that you need to consider when you're trying to come up with a way to offer your movie's profits to people uh, in exchange for working on the film. Uh, number one, make sure to clearly define what profit means. Uh, the simplest way of thinking about profit is that it means the revenue from a business minus its cost uh, over some period of time. So if you had a company that made $1,000 last quarter but paid $900 in costs, then you would be left with $100 in profit. But if we're putting together a contract that gives a cast or crew member a share of the movie's profits, uh, we're going to have to get more specific than just saying that profit equals revenue minus cost. The contract is going to need to carefully define the meaning of those terms. Uh, why is that? Well, if you, if you end up with a high quality problem that your film actually makes a significant profit, you don't want there to be any uncertainty about how the profit is to be calculated uh, so that people don't suddenly come out of the woodwork and start claiming that you miscalculated the amount that you owed them and you actually owe them a lot more. And then they threaten to sue you or at least they make your life difficult. For example, how do you calculate the revenue you've made from the film? Uh, obviously, it would include the production company's share of the money received by theaters and video on demand platforms like Amazon and so on from the audience who watched the film, the people who paid to watch the film. But suppose, for example, that there's product placement in the film. Uh, does the revenue figure you use for calculating profits include the money you got from the brands that placed products in your film? Uh, what about money advanced to your company by a distributor to help you finish the film? Like, for instance, if you pre-sell the right to distribute the film in foreign countries uh, in exchange for an advance from the distributor, um, is, that, is that revenue for the purposes of calculating profit? Uh, it's important to be clear about issues like this because they affect the amount of money that your company is going to end up owing to people in the event that it does make a profit and you've promised them profit shares. Uh, here's a sample clause in a profit sharing provision of an indie film contract that deals with these issues in, in some detail. Uh, this clause talks about adjusted gross receipts, which basically means the revenue that the production company gets from any kind of sale or rental or other commercial exploitation of the film. Uh, as you can see, adjusted gross receipts is specifically defined here to exclude, in other words, to not include, amounts received and used to fund production of the film. So money invested in the film doesn't count as revenue for the purposes of calculating profits. Uh, it also includes monies received for product placement. So if you know, Chipotle paid you money to show someone eating a burrito bowl in the film, the money they paid you is not going to be a part of adjusted gross receipts, according to this definition. Uh, again, this kind of clause is super specific in order to avoid disputes. So for example, people who you've agreed to share profits with are not going to come back and say, I'm entitled to a share of the money that Chipotle paid you for the product placement. But that's not all the agreement says in defining the profits that the cast and crew will get. Um, under this agreement, a bunch more money is going to be paid out of the revenue from the film before the cast and the crew and the investors get any access to it at all. Uh, here's what I mean. Let's move on to the provision that comes next in this sample contract, which is called waterfall. Uh, this provision starts by defining another term, gross collections. To compute gross collections, we, we subtract any distribution fees and expenses and taxes from adjusted gross receipts. So remember that earlier we defined adjusted gross receipts as basically all revenue the production company gets from the film, excluding um, investment payments and so forth, and product placement things and, and things of that nature. Then we have a long list or a waterfall that shows who's going to receive payments from the gross collections and, and in what order. Why is this called a waterfall? Well, imagine a waterfall, but instead of water, what's coming off the cliff is loads of cash. Now imagine that behind the cash waterfall, there are a bunch of ledges on the cliff that people are standing on. Uh, the people standing on the top ledge will get the first chance to grab the cash as it falls. 
the people on the bottom ledge will be able to grab whatever cash is left after all the people above them have had a chance to take their share. So for example, near the top of this waterfall, you have the collection, the collections agent, uh, which is the person responsible for distributing profits to investors and people involved in the film. Uh, hopefully, as I'll talk about a little bit later, that person is not the filmmaker because the filmmaker probably doesn't have the necessary expertise to do that. And of course, they'd rather be out there making movies. Uh, anyway, the collection agent, according to the waterfall we see in this agreement, gets to recoup any expenses they have to pay to distribute the profits. Uh, if you, the filmmaker, pay a collection account manager to handle the distribution of the profits, that would be this type of expense. So the collection account manager will get paid before profits flow down to the other remaining people on this list. And there's all kinds of people listed here. You've got tax intermediaries, sales agents, people who are entitled to deferred pay. I'm, I'm going to do another video on what deferred pay is and how to make that happen. Uh, payments owed to entertainment business unions like SAG-AFTRA and IATSE and so on. Um, all those people under this agreement get paid out of the gross collections before money goes to the investors and to the people involved in the film, meaning to the cast and the crew. Uh, why is this list so specific? Again, it's so that nobody gets surprised and upset that, that somebody else is getting paid before them. Uh, in other words, so that nobody sues you, the production company, because you gave someone else a higher ledge behind the waterfall than they got, and they didn't expect that that was going to happen. So the point is that you need to carefully and pretty specifically define what profit means for the purposes of the profit participation that's going to happen in your film. Ideally, you're going to have a lawyer to help you do this. I, I would advise that here. Uh, number two, make sure it's clear what share of the profits everyone gets. Ultimately, it's up to you, the filmmaker, which people involved in the film are going to share in the profits. Uh, you're not required by law to share the profits with anyone. And the mere fact that you share profits with one cast or crew member who worked on the film uh, doesn't require you by law to share profits with anybody else. It's really just a matter of what you can negotiate with every cast and crew member you know, on an individual basis. Uh, and the profit share that's appropriate is probably going to vary by the individual person you're, you're negotiating with. So for example, if you have a cast member who's fairly well known, but you can't afford to pay them what they're normally used to getting, um, and they, let's say they really believe in the project and they think that there's a, actually a likelihood that it's going to make a profit, uh, you might be willing to offer them as much as 10 to 15% of the profits from the film. Uh, or you might just offer every principal cast member some smaller number like 1% or 2%, just to give the appearance to everybody, at least, that you're offering something more than the small fee that you may be paying them uh, as an indie filmmaker, because we all know that budgets tend to be kind of tight. Now, of course, cast and crew members may talk to each other. And if the cast learns that some actors are getting profit shares and some are not, um, that may upset the cast members who are not getting profit shares. And so for optics purposes, like I was saying before, you might want to offer all of the principal cast members something. Um, unless you're talking about some big name actor who is working with actors who are not as well known. And in that case, it's probably going to make more sense to people that you know the big name actor is getting a bigger share of the pie. One important thing to do is to make sure that you're keeping track of the profits that you're doling out to the cast and the crew members, and also to your investors. Uh, I'll talk about investors in, in some more detail later. Uh, you'll need to provide a summary of this to whoever is ultimately responsible for distributing the profits, and your distributor might want to see it as well. Uh, at a bare minimum, you want to keep a spreadsheet or a list like the example that I'm showing you here, uh, which shows the percentage of profits that the production company uh, has agreed to pay every cast and crew member. Also, unless you're solely creating this film as you know a calling card to try to get future work, I would try to make sure that you're leaving some big percentage of the profits for you, the production company, uh, the filmmaker. If this film actually does turn a profit in light of all the insane things that I'm sure you've done to make it happen, you should be rewarded for that. Um, at any rate, uh, make sure not to give out more than 100% of the profits for obvious reasons. Uh, number three, make sure the timetable for payment is clear. So the next question to address is how often are you going to pay out shares of profits? Are you going to pay them on a quarterly basis? Are you going to pay them twice a year? Uh, how long after the end of the quarter or whatever pay period we're talking about will the checks be sent out? Um, is there going to be some kind of threshold amount of profit that the production company has to earn before a payment gets made? Uh, this last question is important because depending on how much it costs you to send out checks and quarterly statements uh, to people who are entitled to profit shares, 
it might not be cost effective for you to make a payout to people when there's a really low profit number. Like if your film only made $1 in profits in the previous quarter, it wouldn't make sense to have somebody, you know, uh, write checks and then put them into envelopes and so forth and, and send them out to the cast and crew. That's going to cost more than a dollar to send just one of those envelopes probably. Uh, so you could have a provision saying that if you make lower than a certain amount in profits in a given quarter, that amount's going to be rolled over to a, a later quarter uh, in which the threshold is met. Another important question to ask is, for how long is the production company going to be paying out profits from the film? Uh, that is, will it be for the entire life of the film? Is it going to be for a specific number of years? Uh, this is important because it will determine how long the filmmaker needs to keep paying the administrative expenses associated with sending out all these checks, like I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, if you need to keep paying out profits basically forever, then someone's going to need to get paid uh, to do that indefinitely, unless it's you personally, the filmmaker who's doing that. And I, I hope that's not the case for, for the reasons that I've talked about before. Uh, here's an example of a clause that deals with the timing of profit sharing payments. As you can see, it says that for the first three years after the theatrical release of the film, the payments are going to be made on a quarterly basis. After that, the payments will be made twice a year. Another important sentence here uh, makes clear that the company will have to pay the actor their profit share within 60 days after the end of the previous quarter so that it's clear when the payments become due. Number four, make sure that all of the profit sharing agreements you use are consistent with each other. Uh, when you have profit sharing provisions in the agreements that you give to your cast and crew, make sure that one agreement that you give to one person doesn't contradict what another agreement that you give to another person says. Uh, I'll give you a common example of, of something not to do here. Um, sometimes I see indie filmmakers sign agreements with a, a cast or crew member saying something like, you know, the actor is going to get 2% of the profits from the film. That is, if the film earns $100 in profit, the actor is going to receive $2. But then the filmmaker starts raising money um, and they start offering investors a share of the profits uh, in exchange for making a payment. So for instance, you might find an investor and sign an agreement with them saying that they'll get all of the profits from the film until their contribution gets repaid, until they get their money back. Uh, and then they'll get 50% of all the profits afterward. Uh, suppose that that investor puts $50 into the film. If the film makes $100 in net profits, then under this approach, the investor will get paid 50 bucks, right? Which repays his contribution. And then he'll get $25 from the remaining amount. Uh, and the remaining $25 after the investor has taken his cut will be distributed among the people on the production side, like the actor who we talked about earlier. Uh, what's the problem here? The problem is that the profit sharing provision that the investor got was very different from the one that the actor got. Um, the actor's profit sharing provision doesn't say anything about investors getting paid first. Uh, so that actor is going to be surprised and possibly upset when the filmmaker starts to make a profit and then starts paying all of that money to the investors and none of the money to the actor, at least until the investors get paid back in full. Uh, in other words, now the actor isn't getting 2% of the profits at all. Instead, they're getting no profits until the investor is paid back. And even then, after the investor is paid back, they're only getting 2% of the profit that's left over after the investor takes 50% off the top. So the actor is now making a lot less money than, than what they thought they were bargaining for. To avoid a situation like this, it's important to have the same kind of language in every agreement that makes clear how the profits are going to be broken down between the people on the production side, again, the actors and the crew and so forth, and the investors. Uh, one common way to do this in independent film is to divide any profits from the film, and again, in, in whatever way you're defining profits, into two buckets. So one for production people and one for investors. Uh, the first step in the way that this usually works is the investors receive all profits until the amount they put in is repaid, like in the example that I talked about a moment ago. Uh, the profits at this stage are divided between the investors on what's called a pro rata basis. So you take the total payments that were made by all investors, and then you ask what percentage of that amount each investor's contribution made up. Uh, so for instance, if I have two investors in my independent film, and one put in $300 and the other put in $700, then the investor who's in for $300 is going to get 30% of the profits until they're paid back, and the investor who put in $700 is going to get 70%. Uh, then in the second step of the process, once the investors have been paid back in full, uh, they start to receive 50% of all profits, and the remaining 50% will go to the people on the production side. Uh, the production bucket is divided up in whatever way is specified in the production company's contracts with the actors and, and the crew and so forth. Uh, for example, you might say that your lead actor gets 5% of the production bucket, your producer gets another 5%, and so forth. 
Uh, the common approach to dividing up profits is what's being used in, in this example that I'm showing you here. Uh, this sample clause uses the term financier share of net revenue to refer to the investor bucket and personnel share of net revenue to refer to the production bucket. Uh, the first part here, Romanet I, uh, refers to what will happen before all of the cash contributions made by any investors in the production of the film are repaid in full. And it says that before investors are repaid in full, the remaining sum shall be allocated to the investors on a pro rata and pari passu basis. Um, I explained a moment ago what pro rata and pari passu means. Uh, that is, each investor gets a percentage of the profits that's equal to their percentage of the total cash contribution made by all investors. The second part here, Romanet 2, uh, refers to what happens after the investors make their money back. Uh, then 50% of the profits goes to the investors, and that 50% is divided up on a pro rata basis. The other 50% goes to the production side, which will be divided up in whatever way the production company specified in its contracts. You don't have to divide profits between the investor and the production side in the way that I just talked about, but it's just a, a common method of dividing up profits in independent film. Another possible approach would be to just divide the profits 50-50 between the production side and the investor side without uh, paying the investors back in full first. It really just depends on what you feel you need to do to attract investors on one hand and to attract high quality cast and crew on the other hand. Uh, so the larger point is that you want every contract with anyone who's getting a share of profits to make very clear how the division of profits is going to work so that nobody gets surprised and, and angry at you later on. Number five, um, this seems like a simple point, but make sure that it's clear that profits are not guaranteed. As you know, there's never any guarantee of profit, you know, regardless of whatever type of business you're doing. But not everyone necessarily understands that, or at least some people might claim not to understand that. And so you want to make sure that you say up front in the contract that there's no guarantee that the film is going to make a profit, and thus there's no guarantee that profit shares are going to be paid to anybody. Uh, this is just to ensure that no one who worked on the film can come back later and claim that you told them that the film was going to make a profit, or you told them that they were guaranteed some specific amount of money. Now, I know you're not out there promising people that you're going to make a profitable film, uh, but people make all kinds of outlandish claims in, in litigation, and you want to make sure that people can't make that kind of claim against you. Uh, here's a sample clause that you might want to have in your agreement that simply says that the film might fail to generate a profit, and therefore that the actor or whoever's uh, entitled to a profit share might not get any money. I, I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Number six, put somebody in charge of distributing the profits. Somebody has to be responsible, like I talked about before, for writing the checks and sending out the statements showing how profits were computed on a quarterly basis or, or whatever uh, period of time you're doing this in. Uh, ideally, you have the resources to work with the professional, what in this case is often called a collection account manager, uh, who can handle the distribution of profits, and you don't have to stay involved or, or do the whole thing yourself. Uh, at the very least, if you can't afford to get someone to help you with distributing the profits at the time that you're signing the contracts, I would at least have a clause in the contract saying that you can delegate the right to handle the distribution of the profits to a third party, like in case you end up making enough money off the film or something else that you do become able to afford to do that in the future. Number seven, decide what other rights people who are receiving profits should have. Uh, these profit sharing agreements often have clauses saying that every time the production company um, pays a share of profits out, let's say on a quarterly basis, they have to accompany that with a statement that shows how the profits were calculated for that quarter. Um, if the cast member is sophisticated or they have uh, sophisticated representation, they'll probably ask for a clause like this in the contract. Uh, also, these agreements often have clauses saying that the person who's entitled to the profit share has the right to audit the company's books and to verify the way that the profits that they're getting were calculated. Uh, who pays for these audits? Uh, it varies by the agreement. Sometimes the agreement will say that it's always the person who's entitled to the profit share who's going to pay for the audit. Uh, in some other agreements, they'll say that if there's a big enough discrepancy between the profits that were actually paid to this person and the profits that they were entitled to, the profits that the audit reveals that they were entitled to, then the production company is going to end up paying the cost of the audit. Say if there was a 5% discrepancy between the profits actually paid uh, and the profits that were owed. Uh, again, this is the type of clause that a sophisticated party, uh, maybe an investor, maybe a performer with some clout, uh, is going to ask for. So as you can tell, this is a complicated topic, and I could probably go on for a much longer time about it. But I think I've given you the basics of what to consider when you're thinking about whether you want to share the profits from your film 
with members of your cast and crew or, or really anyone else. Um, of course, none of this is meant to be legal advice because if I were going to give you legal advice, I would have to understand the specific facts of your situation and I'd have to know your specific needs. Uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm just a lawyer talking to you on YouTube. So if you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate it if you like the video and subscribe to the channel so you can help me keep putting out this kind of educational content to enterprising filmmakers such as yourself.